with us Dr. Unkyonko, and uh, we are going to invite Frank Materia, um, he's a second year PBH student, and he's working in Dr. Josh Smith's lab, and he's going to do the introduction today. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, so today I'm pleased to introduce to you the Biobehavioral Health Colloquium speaker, Dr. Eun Kyung Choi. Dr. Choi is an assistant professor in the College of Information Sciences and Technology here at Penn State University Park. Dr. Choi received her BS in Industrial Design from Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, her MS in Information Management and Systems from the University of California, Berkeley, and her PhD in Information Science from the University of Washington. She's also worked with leading technology companies, including Microsoft, Google, Motorola, and Samsung. Dr. Chui's research interests span the fields of human-computer interaction and health informatics. She's interested in studying techniques for designing technology to aid individuals in becoming empowered through leveraging their own personal data. Within the College of ISD, Dr. Chui leads Design Square a collaborative group of students and researchers studying ways to promote healthy behaviors through the self-monitoring process. Dr. Chui conducts her research within a variety of contexts and populations relevant to biobehavioral health. Some of her current projects involve enhancing doctor-patient communication through self-tracking and sharing of health data, leveraging intergenerational family relationships to assist elderly individuals in utilizing health tracking technology, and exploring best practice methods for designing persuasive feedback messaging to promote healthy, positive behaviors. We look forward to hearing more about this research today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Eun Kyung Choi. Thank <laughs> you. 
um, used to mostly for the disease management purposes, but now um, the, the, the purpose of cell monitoring has been changed a little bit. Now people are using cell monitoring for health and wellness management purposes. So, um, and there's this um, people who are doing cell monitoring for fun because um, if the data reveals really fun facts about um, people. It was um, usually initiated by clinicians, as I mentioned. The clinician was the one who asked their patients to collect their data and then use that data. But really, right now, anyone can initiate self-tracking and self-monitoring because now there are so many tools out there that people can get by and use, um, such as wearable trackers and mobile apps. They can just quickly install mobile apps on their phone and start tracking themselves. Or um, they can also use Excel spreadsheet or um, Google spreadsheet and then jot things down um, depending on what they want to try and how they want to track. So today I'm going to talk a lot about wearables and pimples and there are just so many uh, wearable trackers that, that come in different form factors. Um, the we band one um, to stand um, the needle, but that costs about $20 and the battery lasts for three months. So that was quite impressive. Um, some of the new things that I spotted recently, it's the belt. Um, it tracks people's waist size and then it also tracks a lot of different physiological um, measurements. Another thing that I recently found out is this uh, women's bra. It also has heart rate um, trackers embedded and it also tracks a lot of different So there are a lot out there, and I call this um, suite of technology called self-monitoring technology, and this is how I define the term, technology that facilitates capturing of the occurrences of public behavior and provides feedback to help people increase awareness and self-reflection. So when I say self-monitoring technology, this is um, what I'm talking about. And I highlighted a key term such as capturing, feedback, self-awareness, and reflection. And highlight these terms really important. Okay, so September, on September 20th, I um, encountered this um, article from your time. Is it anyone, um, did you see this article that talks about um, this new study from the University of Pittsburgh? Um, they studied that activity tracker actually undermines um, one's exercise at home. Are you familiar with this? Okay. So that that was really intriguing, and I was, you know, um, I really wanted to check this out. So um, I looked up the study, and then they actually had the control and intervention condition, and the study was for about two years. And then they actually found out that. Um, People in the intervention condition who use um, this armband type of activity tracker, they, they, um, people in that intervention condition actually exercise less than people in the control condition. And then um, that, that was why, why um, and, and that was really interesting from many different perspectives because people thought that activity tracker might help people to collect data and hopefully um, make them exercise more, but it was actually the, the opposite. So that got me to thinking, what was the control condition like? Um, and when, when I read a paper, the control condition was like this. So they made people go to their study website to log their diet and exercise every day for two years. To me, that's like fantastic <laughs> intervention. Um, as long as people can keep doing that for that long amount of time, that's actually an amazing opportunity for people to capture their data and reflect on their data, uh, which is not usually happening with these automated tracking tools. So um, I was really excited about this work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what those things, um, how to capture things, how to provide feedback, and how that um, makes people think more and reflect on their 
So, um, personal informatics is the term that XCI researchers use, um, especially those who are studying and designing and evaluating self-tracking technology. And this is the pipeline that, that I use. Um, when we say self-tracking technology, um, it does a lot of different things. It usually starts from the data collection piece, and then with the data that people collected, um, people have to make sense of it. They have to explore the data, and um, they have to analyze the data, so that they can use the data. And after that, um, there's a lot of design opportunities in leveraging the data by sharing self-monitor data between doctors and patients. So um, today I'm going to talk about, well, I thought about talking about three different projects, but I quickly realized that, um, well, it's not going to happen because I cannot get in um, all three um, within the time limit. So I'm going to focus on this particular uh, study one and study two that maps to um, that data collection piece and data exploration and analysis piece. Hopefully, um, data sharing this is the topic we have. Okay, so let me begin with um, this first study that I did um, back in the University of Washington and the paper was published in 2015 and So, when we look at um, this different data capture mechanism, it's a spectrum. So on one hand, there's a manual tracking, such as um, pen paper, or longer data on Excel spreadsheet, or um, Google spreadsheet. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the fully automated tracking, which means the data is collected automatically. And there's pros and cons for each of these um, data tracking modes. So if we think about the manual tracking, there are some positive aspects to manual tracking, such as it increases people's self-awareness because they are putting their effort in um, capturing the data. So that's actually the engagement piece. Um, it's also very flexible because you can just capture anything that, that you like and any frequency that you like. Um, and some per particular type of data can only be captured manually. So if you can think of um, things like subjective sleep quality, it's essentially asking you how did you feel um, right after you, you, um, you get up in the morning. So that kind of subjective sleep quality can be captured with, um, in, in this way. However, um, the capture burden is pretty high. So, um, and, and people it's so easy to forget to log things because there are key disadvantages. If we um, think about the automated capture, um, the, dis uh, the advantages are um, it reduces people's mental load, mental load because data is just automatically captured by all those devices. And depending on the type of data, accuracy is actually better than on manual tracking. So, um, an example would be step count, right? Um, even though people can count their steps like one, two, three, they cannot do that for 24 hours, and it would be definitely really painful to do that. But um, in that case, um, automated tracking, so step count is fairly accurate, um, has been improved for um, a lot. However, um, you now have to remember to wear the device. Um, that's another um, disadvantage, and then it reduces engagement with the data because now you are distant from the data that's being collected. So what that means is that you have to put your extra efforts in looking at the data and then looking at the feedback and trying to make sense of what that all means. So um, in the sleep tracking field, um, a lot of work has been done in that automated capture, um, capturing um, piece. So the work like Toss and Turn or SWP, what they are trying to do is using the phone to capture people's sleep. So looking at how people interact with the phone and the accelerometer, the gyroscope, the microphone, and trying to use the sensor data to detect people's sleep, and people don't have to do anything. So that's for that automated capture. There's another work um, done by my colleagues at UDOC. Um, it's called Lullaby, and this one um, 
anywhere on that big timeline, it actually leads to um, the whole app. So the goal was to um, try to lower the access burden. And lastly, the goal of the, the sleep time app was to help people reflect on their sleep behavior through so designing different feedback for people was really important. So here are some of the feedback that I provided. Um, the first one is showing the daily view, um, which shows when they fully slept, and then what are the things that they did throughout the day on um, the three months. And then some of the um, activities were on um, duration. And then the second view is the boring view. So from this, the color represents the sleep quality. So red is bad, green is good. Um, and then um, using, uh, looking at the, the length of the bar, that's the sleep duration. And then you can see um, the regularity or the consistent view. And then lastly, um, I provide a comparison view um, to help you understand what they did differently depending on the sleep quality. So for example, when they had a good night's sleep, um, what was the situation like? And on that particular um, base, what they did, how many complaints they had when they had a good night's sleep versus poor night's sleep. So to evaluate this kind of application, um, the, the method that HCI researchers use is a real-world deployment study. So there were two conditions. The first condition, which is the control condition, um, they only installed the, the regular app. The intervention condition, they installed everything. So the regular app, the lock screen with it, and then the hook screen with it. So uh, they're trying to compare how having this widget on their lock screen affected their capturing behavior. So the study was um, a three-phase study from um, the um, pre-study phase of doing interviews and questionnaire, and then we did we had people use the app for four weeks, and then after four weeks they came back to the lab so that we could do the debriefing interview. So we recruited 20 participants, and then we only assigned to um, under. So um, there, there's a lot of data, such as the interview data, the log data, and then there is the tracking, tracking log. Um, today I'm going to talk about those two things. Um, so let me start with the data capture behavior. In terms of the number of total captured diary, which is defined by the number of diaries, that the sweet diaries that people capture over the 28 days, um, people in the full system condition who had access to the widget um, they captured more diaries. Actually, um, it was um, so they captured ninety two percent, and people in the app only system who didn't have the widget, they captured the less number of sleep diaries because um, chances are they forgot to log in some case. And if those um, people who captured the sleep diaries in the full system, eighty eight percent of the the sleep diaries were accessed from the widget, meaning that people actually interacted with the widget a lot. In terms of the the uh, the capturing of the contributing factors, which is um, there there were these little icons that represent different behaviors. People in the full system condition um, captured 150 um, activities um, throughout. The study, and then that only condition, um, the average was 141, and um, there was no a difference between the condition. Another thing that I look at is the difference between uh, the time difference between when an event happened and when people captured that particular behavior, because. Um, you, you could use the app and then the widget as a near near time capturing tool because it's right there. So when you had real world and you had coffee, you can just click the icon. But um, when you actually look at the data, um, there was a big time difference between the event and the one to actually capture um, the data. So people in the post-event condition, the difference was about 70%. 
behaviors, then if you look at um, so the x axis is the hour of the day starting from the midnight to um, the, the midnight of the um, day, to 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. And the y axis is the number of activities that people have. To. And if you look at this, um, people in most conditions, what they did was they actually captured a lot of data right before going to sleep. So, um, can anyone think of why that had been the case? They worked all day. They were students, so I hope that they worked all day. So, let's imagine you're trying to capture maybe a, a cup of coffee or um, your lunch meal. Okay? You're having this um, exciting lunch with your friends, and while you're having lunch, wouldn't it be so cool if you, you know, <laughs> look up the phone and then I'm trying to capture your meal while there's another person um, next to you? Um, it's not. It's not cool. <laughs>
can actually increase the accuracy by semi-automated tracking because um, if the data is captured 100% um, by automated system, um, some data is not accurate. So you want people to go and edit it. So for example, the sleep data, if you look at the sleep data, chances are it's not really that accurate. And people who want to edit their sleep data, they should be able to do that. So that's what I mean by combining um, the system-driven approach and the human And then by designing semi-automated system, you can actually leverage and, and maintain this awareness because people are in the loop. So um, what I am working on right now is to create Sleep Time Plus Plus, which is about uh, combining those um, manual tracking and automated tracking. So insights objectives with quality, which should come from human, um, should be used while um, the automated tracking data of sleep can be combined. So I want to play in the game. So every morning you will get this reminder to log your sleep. And then if you um, access the app, the data is coming from Fitbit. So it's right there. And then you can enter your subjective sleep quality because that's important. And then um, save it. And when you have a cup of coffee, you can still capture those things on the last screen by just clicking on that coffee icon. And in that way, you can capture those contributing factors. And then the feedback is provided um, in a similar way. The two-week view, the four-week view. So I want to wrap up this first part of the study by um, highlighting that um, we really want to leverage this manual capturing moment because it's a really um, important moment for people to reflect on their data. And I um, hope you to think about that aspect, um, not just trying to remove the manual capture piece, but how we can leverage that particular um, moment. Now I want to move on to the study two, which is about helping people explore um, and analyze their personal data. So a lot of these wearable trackers and commercial trackers, they provide feedback in many different ways. Um, the first, the loop, um, it provides the feedback on the device itself. Or you can access your mobile app, you can open the mobile app to get the feedback. Or if you are more dedicated, you can actually log on um, to your web account and then get uh, more detailed feedback on the web uh, website. So they really have this dashboard um, and timeline where you can actually uh, look at your data in many different ways. The problem here is that people don't do this um, much. Um, they look at the, the feedback on the device itself. Um, so I look at the feedback here. Um, but I don't necessarily play with my data or I don't necessarily um, explore the data by uh, trying to go to those apps or websites. Um, I should be doing more. But um, sometimes I just forget to do it and I don't think that's interesting enough. So I don't do that. So actually, in the NCR literature, there has been a lot of studies that look into how um, people interact with their own personal data and what are the difficulties that they have in exploring their personal data. Um, some of the reasons are like this. People don't know what to do with the data. But they know the data is there, but they don't know the value. They don't appreciate where they, they think that the data is just so simple and not interesting enough. Another reason why people don't leverage their data much 
data because they would be really cumbersome to do that. And many of the companies don't provide that raw data to individuals. You have to, um, you have to code uh, the program and then use the API to download the particular type of data that, that you want, but most of people don't do that. Let's say you can translate the question and then um, and turn that into data attributes and run some statistical tests, but now there's another big hurdle, which is visualization. So for many lay individuals, it's very hard for them to um, create um, a good visualization with the, the, the particular data that can best represent their insights. And lastly, I think this is a really big problem. Um, which is data is scattered across all different platforms. So um, your Fitbit data is of course in Fitbit server. Um, if you want to look at your location data, it's probably in the Google server if you use Android. If you use iPhone, it's probably in the Apple server. Um, and you might be using like Excel spreadsheet to track the number of campaigns or your way. It's also in a different platform, so what this essentially means is that you have to put extra effort to integrate all these different data from different um, platforms, which is a lot of work. So research question for me was how we can, um, how can we support people to reflect on their personal data through visualization? And to, to just to support that, what that means is that we have to create a platform where people can easily in import their data from different sources and then um, create visualization for them so that they can explore their own personal um, data. Visualization is just so powerful tools for people to um, learn insights. So for example, this person um, who has been tracking her weight data um, since 1975, recently and created this visualization to, to um, and then also annotated on the visualization so that um, she, can, she can explain what has been going on um, when she had baby and so forth. So this kind of visualization is so quick to communicate um, all those different insights and share these insights with other people. Um, another powerful aspect of visualization is the, the interactive aspect. So this is a really cool website. Oops. Now I ask you to visit um, these sites where you can quickly explore what Britons have been eating for the past 30 years. And then in the past, they've been eating a lot of potato, but then if you move, if you drag that, um, the handle to um, 2015, they've been eating less potato, but having a lot more um, veggie, green meat, um, veggie, um, that excludes potato. So that kind of insight, you can get it within three seconds by exploring and interacting with the so I really wanted to leverage this visualization to help people explore and um, gain insights. So we built this tool called Visualize Self. And then the first thing that it does is to help people import their data from different sources. So for example, um, Fitbit has many different data streams such as step counts, calories, sleep, heart rate, weight, if you have the Wi-Fi scale and then they also provide badges. Um, I also use this Viva application for moves, which collects my location data and then the step count data. So step count is coming from these two different sources. And then we also supported other devices such as Microsoft and um, Rescue Time to um, import people's productivity level and um, Runkeeper. Um, there are many runners who use Runkeeper to track um, their ones. Another um, thing that we supported was um, providing this interactive visualization where first they can select the particular type of data that they want to explore and then um, choose this duration 
Um, and then, um, zooming, zooming in that particular duration that they fit. And lastly, um, from my previous work, I learned that a lot of people do temporal comparison with their own data. So uh, we thought about different ways to help people quickly, uh, um, quickly explore temporal comparisons um, with their data. So what that means is that people can compare their data across days of the week, or before or after a particular um, date, or they can compare notes of the year, or they can take two time spans and then compare what they did differently um, during across those two time spans. So for example, this shows that this is my own data. Um, I had a lot more step counts on Fridays and Saturdays compared to other days. And then if I look at um, the summer of last year, I had a lot more step counts during the weekends compared to um, long weekends because I used to hike. Um, during the weekend. <coughs> to evaluate um, this particular system, we invited 11 cell trackers who have who already um, collected a lot of um, data using different tools such as Fitbit, Area, um, Microsoft Band. And then we invited them to the lab and then have them um, import their data on our server and then interact with our visualizations. And then we ask them to think aloud. It's another particular method that HCI researchers use um, because if they don't talk out loud, we don't know what they are thinking. So I was sitting next to them and then kept asking, so what do you see here? Or um, can you tell me what's going on here? Um, things like that. And then after that, we did the working in our video. I want to play a video um, of this person trying to import his data. Just to give you um, the context of what it's like. So I'm gonna make it really big. So he's trying to log into all these different servers, but the wrong keeper. Microsoft Band, and then after he logged in, he can um, he just imported his Microsoft Band data and other ones, the screen, um, step count from Fitbit and calories and so forth. He's also runner, so he imported his one keeper um, data to um, choose the, the route, the path, and then the distance and so forth. Like this is where I kind of a low point that I wanted to 
region. It's interesting to see. I haven't gone back up, but it's interesting to see that I've kind of hung out for the better part of a year. Went on vacation again. <laughs> Clearly, vacations are not good for my uh, healthy eating habits. Interesting. And that's, oh, that's interesting as well. So if I'm going to zoom in on the most recent part of this data, because I've actually been trying to kind of get ready for the summer. Okay, so starting, let's start. So looking January to the present, which is when I said I was going to start getting healthier again. So I actually did kind of a lot of local pickups. It's interesting. The weekends, so the weekends are really hurting me. Again, so that's kind of interesting. It's definitely, I like having the weekend, weekend shader turned on. Uh, so let's see, looking here. Interesting. So I huh, went on vacation. That's starting to become a really disturbing trend. I'm curious to see what happened here. Um. Okay. Um, so that was about a minute long um, length of the video, and he actually talked about a lot of different things. So the first thing that he talked about is the context, um, the contextual information. Um, what I mean by external context is that it's really interesting to analyze your personal data, but that's not in the data, that's in your brain. So the data doesn't necessarily reflect all the interesting aspects of a person. So when you look at the visualization, that actually reminds people of what they did, how they did at a particular time point. And that's really, really important to help people um, understand what's going on. So things like vacation or um, the weekends. So we really like um, the, the, um, the different, he, he noticed the difference between weekend versus weekend. Um, that's another important context, and people also talked about a lot of different contexts, such as surgery. So that's something in people's brain, but not necessarily captured in the data itself. So those are really interesting and important things in analyzing personal data. Um, lastly, I want to um, play another video which shows um, how people use the comparison feature. So here he is looking at his step count data from Fitbit and Microsoft Band and trying to compare um, those two different time spans.
which is this one, how to help people create interesting questions and test them. Because people talked about a lot of questions and trying to identify answers to the questions, but um, they were hypotheses. So to be able to actually systematically answer those questions, they actually have to run a statistical analysis or collect more data and, and, and analyze the data later. Um, another interesting question to think about is this value of contextual information. So contextual information is not there, but um, people kept asking us whether they can import their calendar data, whether they can import all those important dates, whether location can be imported and so forth. So what are the ways to really combine this interesting contextual data so that they can use that contextual information when analyzing their own data. And lastly, um, even though people like this idea of exploring their data, some people were curious uh, whether there could be um, a system-driven approach, um, whether, whether there's something like that, and, and then um, combine that with human-driven um, inside approach, meaning that things like identifying trends, identifying correlations, uh, those can be actually, those are the ones that the systems are really good at, but um, people might look at the correlation that, that might not there to so, um, perceive correlation. Um, so that's something that we are thinking about how to um, combine the system driven effects with the human driven effects. So um, this particular study, um, I talked about how we can help people reflect on their feedback while they are receiving the feedback or uh, looking at the aggregated feedback because that's another chance where you can really um, bolster self-reflection for people to leverage their own data. So um, going forward, let me just talk about some of the other work that I am doing, which is about how to leverage dispersal data in the medical context and how to help doctors and patients share and leverage their personal data. So for example, right now, um, there's no, no tool that can help doctors systematically prescribe tracking to their patients. They just ask them to collect a certain thing and, and patients use pen and paper to collect those things. But um, I am currently developing this tool called OmniTrack that helps people construct their own trackers depending on their own needs. Um, so it's a very flexible way of, for people to um, design a tracker so that I don't have to do that. Um, people can just create their own tracker. And I, I see that there, there can be some opportunities for doctors to leverage this kind of flexible tracking tools and prescribe tracking to their patients. Another thing that I'm working on is the visualization aspect. So if people are going to share uh, personal data, there has to be um, the sharing platform where doctors and patients can get the data together. So I'm working on this particular project in the context of um, quality behavior therapy for insomnia where um, still they are using a lot of um, pen and paper which is very hard to um, from, from the sharing aspect. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you to, to be here and um, all of this work was funded by um, National Science Foundation and Microsoft Research and then um, there are some collaborators from University of Washington, Microsoft, and um, my name is Yuri Tsai, and I'm a PhD student at ISD. Thank you. that 
reported during the daytime or you know whatever actions or however you describe it so in the daytime? Uh, I, I didn't particularly look at the number of items that was captured during daytime. Um, we have to define what the daytime is, but um, looking at the looking at the graph visually, um, I did you see the difference? Yeah, there was a really big difference in the daytime, but I, it wasn't clear um, okay. how they were interacting. Hmm. If I go back and look at the data again, because um, yeah. so, so I, speaking speaking of visual exploration, I think there is um, um, so visual exploration is good for creating hypotheses. Not necessarily for testing the hypothesis. And it seems like you, you capture that and I feel that's the disadvantage of visual exploration, but I'll go back and check the data. So I really like that you're using, thank you for that answer. Um, I like that you're using design. And uh, one of your biggest advantages with the widget is that you're overcoming the limitation of just the standard phone. You can explain there's a lot of clicks to find a place in an app. Um, what do you think uh, either design or instructions or engagement, whatever it is, what elicits sustained uh, uh, accurate reporting in design or other terms? That you, what, any, any insights? So if the data or the kind of activity um, that they are trying to capture has some negative connotations, people immediately should um, meaning that, let's say, if they are trying to capture alcoholic beverage and the alcoholic beverage or tobacco use icon is right there on the lock screen, people of course didn't like that. So some because they were aware that other people might be you know, coming over. So what that means is that they hide that particular icon and then the cook the icon that has very generic um, meaning or neutral meaning. Um, so things like caffeinated beverage, there was pretty much a neutral behavior and people were okay putting that kind of icon on the last screen and then were able to capture those. Uh, anything that contains negative aspects about themselves, such as alcoholic beverage, tobacco use, um, people didn't like that stress was an thing. Um, another aspect is that um, we actually showed people's sleep duration and sleep quality on the lock screen once they enter the data. If that contains a really negative thing such as, oh, I've been sleeping for only for four hours, then they get constantly reminded that they get this really short um, duration of sleep, so people were actually stressed out. So what we learned from that particular one was it's actually not good to project people's personal data on the lock screen. So, um, it, and anything that's negative, people won't use it, but have them an ability to um, fake it. So for example, instead of putting like a tobacco icon, you can just assign a color and then just let the person use, but not the other people around them. And that's uh, another workaround to, um, to address that problem. That works? Um, that, that was a design um, idea that we got from um, this particular study. So, um, I hope so. <laughs> Is there a question? Um, regarding compliance, sort of to follow up on our panel's uh, comment, um, I would think that with some of these things, people find it quite it's uh, quite fun to be able to um, use this and be able to track things, but you follow them for uh, months often. How, how much does that wane? So do you tend to get high compliance in the first week or two, and then people get a little tired of it, or are you able to keep high compliance the whole time? Um, so people in the widget condition, um, the compliance was pretty high, um, as you saw. Um, the, the compliance to the diary so once a day thing and a lot of people just kept was they, they were good at capturing this once a day for the whole week that day. Um, people in the um, the regular app condition, uh, even though the compliance was 70 something percent, it's not too bad. It means that it didn't like drop like that. They were able to capture it on the um, The contributing factors um, I did 
even see the drop um, at least for the four week period because um, the, the average number was pretty high across the participants, meaning that they were able to quickly capture those and there was no difference um, across the two conditions. So I didn't see um, yeah, I didn't see a lot. You highlighted a large difference between the band and Fitbit in terms of accuracy, and I was wondering if you had developed any opinion about the either device. Um, it really depends on how people use those variables. So there could be some difference between the algorithm and how they detect things. So for example, if I were wearing bands and Fitbit at the same time and then compare the number, and if I see the big difference, then there's probably some difference in terms of how they design the algorithm. But here, what people mention um, could be a lot of different things because the, the time didn't really overlap a lot. There was usually what it looks like is that they were using one tool and then there was a short overlap, overlapping duration because they, that's the time when they were trying to switch to a new device and then um, abandon the previous device and move on to the new device and they have this new set of data that they collected. Um, the way people compare those two time spans was interesting because we, we might think that um, it, it, it would make sense if you compare um, this previous time period and the new time period which are collected by different devices and how do you make sense of it. But people didn't seem to have a lot of issue comparing these two um, data collected from two different devices. Um, so I was like sitting next to them and um, I didn't quote that much about, you know, that doesn't really make sense. You might have moved to a new place or uh, you might, um, you know, to a new gym or something like that. Who knows what? But um, they didn't seem to care much. But there were a few people who actually collected data from two different devices at the same time and see the difference. I think for them, it was a real big red flag. And people are trying, when, when they notice those things, they are trying to explain to themselves why that might have been the case. So for example, one person said, well, this was the, the previous version of Fitbit, and after I changed it to the newer version of Fitbit, I suddenly got higher bed counts, meaning that they probably have some difference in terms of the hardware or the algorithm that they designed or something like that. So they were trying to understand, um, but we don't know um, what the I was on a golf cart a while ago and I, I hit 10,000 steps. I'm on a golf cart. <laughs> so all of a sudden my thing's vibrating, this sort of thing. So it's not perfect. Any other questions? Um, were you able to measure any behaviors? So you said you measured resolutions that the people made. Did you actually see if those translated into actual behavior where they changed the behavior as, as a result of So unfortunately that was a lab study that we did. So all the things that people talked about, those are all captured in a qualitative way. Meaning that they were thinking aloud and then we transcribed everything that people talked about and then trying to create a code, code book of these different insights and then we counted all those insights and trying to create categories of different insights. So it wasn't really tied to their actual um, behavior. And one more thing, did you measure any traits? So for example, did you actually measure trait levels of self-monitoring or trait levels of self-awareness to see if that affected um, the amount that they actually used the feedback that they were getting? Did you? I'm not sure what you can find. So you can measure self-monitoring and self-awareness as traits, not as states. So a state would be, in this case, that they look at the information and they become higher on self-monitoring maybe, but um, as a trait. So did you measure personality in any way to, to predict their use? No, um, it was a very small number of people. I think it was 11 among people. So um, the, the way I see, the way I interpret, uh, the, you're talking about the second study, right? So um, it doesn't very, have to be the second. Okay. <laughs> um, we can consider this as a qualitative um, data with a very 
really crappy. And as a manager, there are people who are stick to that and then and then um, keep using other people they keep up really, really. And I'm trying to understand what makes that difference between, between those two groups. Um, if you have any good idea, um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to listen because I, I, I see that all the time whenever I run any kind of study. It's not necessarily that people like the tool or they love the tool, but it's just that they are, I don't know, known that way. Or, so we see that all the time. Thank <laughs> you. 